Hey everyone, so for this video we're going to go over the problem reverse integer. So I figured this would be a good problem to go over just because the acceptance rate is pretty low. So hopefully this is useful for some people that had some problems solving this. So the problem description says given a 32-bit signed integer, reverse digits of an integer. So in example 1 we're given 123 as the input, we need to return the reverse of it, 321. So pretty easy to understand what we need to do, but it also notes that assume we are dealing with an environment which could only store integers within the 32-bit signed integer range. For the purpose of this problem, assume that your function returns zero when the reversed integer overflows. So let's jump over to the whiteboard and I'll show you guys how to solve this. So we're going to go over the example reversing 123 to 321. And to do this, we need to do some simple arithmetic. So obviously, our ending digits in our input is going to become the starting digits in our output. So the first digit we need to be able to extract from our input is the number 3, right? And then that will become our input, right? So we're going to need a variable. And we can just call this output, because we are going to be building our output. And remember, our input is an integer, it's not a string. So we, we're not going to simply convert our integer to a string and then reverse it, right? Uh, I don't think an interviewer would expect that anyway. So we're only going to be using integers to solve this. So we have our output, and initially this can be 0. And then we're going to have an input variable, and this input variable will obviously be 123 initially. And so we want to extract the number 3 from our input. So to do that, we can perform a modulus operation. So if we did 123 mod 10, that would give us a value of 3. Because what the modulus will do, when we do mod by 10, the base 10, then that will always give us the last digit in our integer. So now this value we're going to add to our input. So whenever we perform this modulus calculation, we're going to add to out, right? Our output. And then we need to be able to shift over our attention to the next value in our input. So to do that, we can do 123 divided by 10. And that would be 12. And so as you can see, when we do division by whole integers, it will remove this last digit uh, in our input. And so whenever we do that calculation, we are going to set this value to our input, right? So let's, let's add these two. Let's update these variables. Let's add to our output. And so there's a specific formula that we need to update our output. So that formula is we could do the output of whatever it currently is times 10 plus the result from the modulus, so plus the remainder. And so if we were to write out that calculation, our current input is 0, so we would say 0 times 10 plus our, our remainder, which is 3, and that equals 3, right? So this value becomes our new output. So we can say this step is now set to output, right? So let's do that. Let's update these. So we have our output. This becomes 3 and then our input becomes 12. And then now we need to move our attention over to the number 2 in our input, right? So let's perform the same calculations. We can do 12 mod 10, and that would be 2, right? And then we do 12 divided by 10, that would be 1. And then we do whatever our current output is, which is 3 times 10 plus 
our remainder, which is 2. And so that would be 32, right? And so this number right here, 32 that we just calculated as our output, that is this these first two numbers in our output. So as you can see, we're building it backwards now. And so let's update our variables. So 3 is now 32, and then 12 just becomes 1, right? And then finally, we need to look at uh, the last digit, 1. And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say 1 mod 10. That would be 1. And then if we did 1 divided by 10, that would be 0. And then we do our current output. So that would be 32 times 10 plus our remainder, which is 1. And that would be 321. So our new output is 321 our input gets set to zero and that's it because once our input becomes zero that is our exit condition so 321 is our final answer so there's still one more thing i want to go over before i jump into the code an edge case we still have to consider is that in the problem description it stated that if our reversed integer is an integer overflow then we need to just return zero from our function so an integer can be a minimum of negative 2 to the 31st power and a maximum of 2 to the 31st power. So imagine if our input was this number, and this number is 2 to the 31st power. So this is the maximum an integer can be. If we were to reverse this number, we would get 8, 4, 6, 3, 8, 4, 7, 4, 1, 2. But obviously, this reversed value, this is greater than 2 to the 31st power. So this would actually overflow. So if we were given this particular input, we need to return 0 from our function. So what we need to do is when we are calculating our output, we need to have a bigger primitive data type that can hold these in these max and minimum integer values so we could use maybe a long right because this is greater than an integer right so this long value would be able to reverse this in uh, this value and we could just check is our output are you greater than 2 to the 31st, or is it less than negative 2 to the 31st? And if this evaluates to true, then we return 0 from our function. So that's just an extra edge case that we have to consider. So next, let's jump into the code, and I'll show you guys how we can do this. So our input is this x variable. And we need to first initialize a result variable. So we can say long result, and this can be 0 initially, right? And so we need to iterate over all of the digits in x. So our exit condition is when x is 0. So we can say while x is not equal to 0, then we will continue to do the logic that we talked about. And by the end of this, we can say return the int value of result because we have to return an integer from this function, not a long, right? And so the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate what our new result will be. So we did the modulus to get the last value in our input, which is x in this case. So let's get that. We could say int remainder is equal to x mod of 10. And then we're simply going to overwrite whatever our result currently is. So we could say result is equal to, to the result times 10 plus our remainder, right? 
And then here is where we're going to check whether our result is greater than the integer max value or less than the integer max value. If either of those conditions are true, we need to return zero, right? So we could say if our result is less than integer dot min value or our result is greater than integer dot max value, then just return zero because if we weren't using this long variable, it would overflow. And then finally, we just need to perform the division of our current input uh, because this will strip away the last digit. So we can say x and divide it by 10 and just assign it to itself. And so if we run that, and there we go. So next, I'll jump into the time and space complexity. The time complexity of our solution is going to be big O of n, where n is the number of digits that we have in our input. We have to perform the calculations for the modulus and division for every single integer until we get our input down to zero. And then our space complexity is constant. Nowhere in our algorithm do we implement any extra memory. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.